As a woman journalist in Iran, sometimes I felt between two worlds. Uh, I couldn't go some places where men only could go. This is Friday prayers, and the sermon is always given by a man. Uh, this is the Supreme Leader of Iran today, Khomeini. Not Khomeini is the previous one, this one is Khomeini. And um, as a TV journalist, you need the sermon, right, as part of your report. So I'd have to give my little camera to a male colleague, and he'd go to the men's side to film while I stayed on the women's side and waited for him to come out. But other times, it was advantageous to be a woman because I felt like other women felt more comfortable with me as a woman. Sometimes I felt between two worlds when I went to the rallies like this, like the ones I'd seen in the pictures before I went to Iran. And people would ask me, where are you from? And I thought, well, you're holding a sign that says down with the USA. Should I really say America? <laughs> um, but sometimes when I told them that I was from America, they would respond, we like Americans. We like American culture. We just have problems with the government and we have problems with some of the policies that they have had toward our region and our country. I went to Iran when this man was president. It was his second term. It's President Mohammad Khatami, and he is a reformist. Um, during his time in office, there was um, some more freedom in society for journalists, too. There were more foreign journalists who got to work in Iran, also dual national journalists like me. And Iranian journalists opened up more publications and were a little bit more daring in what they wrote. I wanted to do some reports about women's rights and women's issues. Um, I found in Iran women face a lot of limits and they also have certain freedoms. Um, and they've made some success, success in, some pa in the past. So these are women in university. About 60%, even more than 60% of the students who enter college every year are women. So there are more women than men in college. Women can drive um, in Saudi Arabia. They're not supposed to drive. But in Iran, women drive buses, they drive taxis. This is a women's taxi agency. The passengers all have to be women or kids. There are women firefighters in Iran. Iran got the first women's firefighting squad in the Middle East. I was still in Iran when this man became president in 2005. His name is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. I'm sure you've all heard about him. Uh, and under his presidency, things began to get a little more restrictive. I also faced limitations to my work under President Ahmadinejad. And I decided uh, I was going to stay in Iran, but I wanted to write a book. I decided to go around the country, and I was talking to people of different races and ethnicities. You've all heard about the Kurds in Syria and Iraq. Well, Iran has a large Kurdish population, too. They, are, they say that there may be like 6 or 7 percent of the population. Um, sorry, 6 to 7 million, or about 10 percent of the population. And this is a Kurdish class of of third grade girls. So I was going around the country and um, researching these issues and starting to write about them. And I was actually getting ready to live, leave the country so that I could finish off the book in some other country, America, when one day my life changed drastically. Four men came to my apartment in Tehran and took me away to this prison. It's the most notorious prison in Iran called Evin Prison which is where many political prisoners are held. What they were accusing me of was espionage. They said that this book that you're writing on Iran, you're interviewing way too many people. It's not possible you could write a book. It's not possible you could be interviewing so many people just to write a book. So this book is a cover for espionage for the US. And somebody in the US government paid you to pretend to write a book so you could spy on Iran. Mm. It's like, wow, you guys are, <laughs> you're, you're really good at this. You should like create your own scenario for a movie or something. Um, and I said, I'm not a spy. I'm writing a, a book. I mean, do you want me to talk to like five people in Iran and say, this is what everybody thinks in Iran? Or do you want me to show the diversity of Iran? I mean, you guys always say Iran is a diverse country. Well, it is. And read what I've written. You'll see it's just a book. And they said, no, we don't believe you unless you confess to being a spy. You could stay here for 10 or 20 years. So there I was, again, between two worlds. If I tell a lie, I stay. Sorry, if I tell a lie, they say I'm going to be freed. If I say I'm a spy and I'm not. They say I'm going to be free. But am I really going to be free? Because even if my body's going to be free, my conscience is always going to feel like it's behind bars. So what I tried to do is, one, I prayed a lot. I prayed more than I ever had in my life. And what's so interesting is the day before I was arrested, the night before I was arrested, I, um, I was praying to God, actually. Complaining to God, I think, was probably a better way to describe it. Because in those days, I, when I talked to God, I, was always, I would always kind of complain about what was happening or ask him for something. Um, and I was 
saying to him, God, you know, I'm, I'm writing this book, but I don't know if it's ever going to get published. I don't know if anybody's ever going to read it. I want it to influence the affairs of the world, but does it really matter because in the end, everybody's going to die anyway? It's really positive, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to die. People are going to die. Why am I doing all this work? And then a few hours later, I get arrested. And then one of those early nights in prison, I was praying to God and I was saying, you know, God, that, that thing I was talking to you about that night before I was arrested, I was really just kidding. <laughs> I, I really do want to live and do good for the world. Just get me out of here, please. So I had to realize that though I couldn't control my physical situation, I still had my faith and I had the power to control my attitude. We always have the power to control our attitudes. Bad things happen to all of us, but what matters most is how we respond to them. I was reminded of this lesson by my cellmates. Uh, after two weeks in solitary confinement, I was taken out of my cell and put in a cell with other women, political prisoners. And they were uh, called prisoners of conscience because, uh, well, Iran doesn't call them that, but like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch call them that. They're being punished for standing up for what they believe in. Uh, they peacefully practice their human rights and they get arrested. I was also reminded the power of attitude by a book that this woman on the left had. You know what that book was? Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. So um, I was rereading that book and I found new meaning in it, especially in these words. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. If Viktor Frankl could have that power in a concentration camp, then I could have it in prison, and we can have it anywhere, right? I was able to get the Bible uh, at some point in prison, in English. It was my own Bible from home. And I read this phrase, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And I whispered those words to me when I was taken into, into interrogation, uh, blindfolded. And it gave me strength, it gave me a lot of courage. And I realized even when people are mean to us or hurt us, they can't hurt our souls. That brings me to a fourth lesson, that to counter fear, we have to have courage. And to find courage, it helps to feel compassion for others. One day, I asked my two cellmates, the ones I showed you before, this question. And they had been in prison longer than I, as I mentioned. One of them, her father had been arrested a while back. He had been tortured so badly that when he came out, he died. And I said, how can you, Fariba and Mafash, feel compassion for these people after all they've done to you and to your families? I get that we're supposed to hate the sin, not the sinner, but I really hate. And you know what they said to me? They said, we don't hate them, we forgive them. We believe in love and compassion for humanity, even for those who wrong us. We hope God will help us show them a better way. And I was lucky I got out because people were calling for my freedom on the outside. I think that's the main reason I got out. I mean, people in North Dakota were holding rallies. They were praying for me. That was my alma mater, um, Northwestern, holding rallies. Some people went on, went on hunger strikes with me. Here I am uh, thanking journalists after I got out. So I talked about a lot of difficulties that Iran has. But the truth is I loved the country. It has so much history, beautiful places, beautiful people, very kind, very warm and generous, who want, I think, the majority of them want a more progressive um, environment, more open environment, and more human rights. And I talked a lot about between two worlds. But in the end, we're all part of one world, really. Getting to know the Iranian people helped me realize that even though we have our differences, our similarities are greater than those. Parents all over the world work hard to give their kids a better future. People all, all over the world want to fall in love and be healthy and happy and free. We also have, all have this ability to feel compassion, to be a voice for people who can't speak out for themselves, to learn and to teach, and to influence the affairs of the world or to serve our region and beyond. So I wish you courage and freedom and adventure, and yes, sometimes some struggles, because even in that struggling and in that suffering, there can be grace. I wish you all these things as you try to influence the affairs of the world and serve your region and beyond. Thanks.